Uh, a lot of them are actually detailed on the conference CD. Oh, hey, Jeff. Uh, give a hand for Jeff Moss. Thanks. We're going to take this off the screen uh, for a second as we enter the IP address. No particular reason. I trust each and every one of you. Well, Michael, uh, Michael is entering the address information. Uh, my name is Dave Endler, Michael Sutton. We work for iDefense. iDefense is a security intelligence company, just to give you a bit of background. Um, Michael and I work for iDefense Labs, the security research arm of iDefense, and one of our keen interests is web application security. Um, today we're going to talk about a very narrow aspect of web application security, but uh, it's an important aspect because uh, these types of vulnerabilities that we're going to be talking about are extremely prevalent on a lot of websites and web applications, software, uh, softwares out there. Uh, additionally, it takes about um, half a second and half a brain to exploit these vulnerabilities. Um, so we're just going to walk through some of the basics, uh, go through some um, just basic concepts of how state mechanisms are applied in a web application sense uh, and how you can easily break through those. So essentially we're going to be talking about how to brute force an application, not necessarily with the traditional username and password, you know, 123, 123, guest, guest, uh, but brute forcing that state mechanism uh, that's usually transparent to the user. Um, while we're getting started, uh, just in terms of the legality of testing these types of mechanisms, in the course of our research, um, we treated a lot of the holes we found, and we are going to be actually demonstrating some live holes that we notified the vendor of about a year ago. They're still there. Um, most of them either ignored us or were somewhat responsible in their uh, response. Uh, one in particular, uh, and I'm not going to say much more about it, but one in particular threatened to sue us. Uh, so these types of vulnerabilities, while they might not seem that, that large, you know, we go through the same sorts of responsible disclosure problems that uh, all of you do as well. Uh, and if Jennifer Granick is in the audience, thank you very much for your help and that of your students. Uh, she was actually able to provide some uh, feedback and did a lot of the legwork when we were contacted by this company. So uh, I'm not going to say anything more about it. And even if I'm completely drunk tonight, uh, you're not going to be able to get me to say who it is. <laughs> I'm having a good time uh, pretending it is. So we don't want to spend a lot of time on the network part, but um, while they work on that, I just want to give another plug. This is actually in the presentation, so it's not taking time out of it. Um, I'm one of the leaders of the Open Web Application Security Project, OWASP, and uh, it's actually a group of volunteers. It's a group of people in an open source community trying to uh, work on some projects that raise the general level of awareness of web application security. Uh, it seems in the last few years um, we've just become, as an industry, we've just become aware that this is its own discipline. Um, so if you take a look at the website, and I was going to walk you through some of the projects we're working on, it's owasp.org, O-W-A-S-P.org. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers. I think there's probably a, a ton of talent in the audience. If you'd like to uh, add your name to a project, and some of the projects are um, kind of a documentation side and, and software side. Uh, the documentation side is actually working on web testing and web building documents to actually provide guidelines. You know, how do you build a secure web application? How do you actually test it afterwards? When we were all looking at the stuff on the internet already, there really wasn't anything out there besides possibly uh, the open source testing methodology uh, from ideahamster.org. Um, so take a look at the site. If you think there are things on there that interest you, drop me an email. The email will be on the presentation shortly, I hope. Yeah, let's just get going. Um, we might take a pause halfway through if we get connectivity, but don't want to delay much more.
So here's just an overview of what we're talking about. Um, in general, we'll just go through some basics so you, we're all on the same page. Uh, go through some fun exploitation examples, and then uh, talk about what developers, uh, essentially there's three audiences, developers, uh, when I say developers, I mean people who actually buy the software from the vendors, um, like BEA, WebLogic, or ATG's Dynamo, um, or you know Tomcat, et cetera. Um, and then what can users do to protect themselves? Um, essentially not much, but we're gonna get into that. And what can vendors do? Uh, and particularly the onus of these types of security vulnerabilities are mostly on the vendors, unfortunately, to fix before they actually get shipped to market. So essentially, let's not spend a lot of time on these basics, but you log into a web application. Web applications are typically protected by user accounts, uh, varying levels. Uh, you might have a user access, uh, editor access, uh, administrative access. So you log in, and thereafter, the website, web server, web application knows who you are. You don't have to actually enter your username and password after each click. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, so in the traditional sense, if someone wanted to, they had nothing to do on a weekend, they could just enter in a bunch of usernames and passwords, and that would be it. Great traditional brute force of a web application. Um, but uh, what happens after you log in, uh, since HTTP is a stateless protocol, uh, developers essentially need a way to recognize that the person who is actually clicking the next click is you. Uh, it would be really bad if you saw other people's banking information. It would be even worse if they saw your information. Um, in fact, I just said the same thing, but um, I said it like this. Thanks for the two people who got that joke. Um, so essentially what happens is we generate a unique string, which is thereafter called the session ID. It's also called a token. I've heard people call it a nonce. Essentially it's just a unique string that you know and the web application knows so that uh, essentially you can thereafter be recognized as that user. Um, a decent example is you go into a bar, the bouncer asks you to see your ID and a credit card. Um, you, sh you authenticate, so to speak. Uh, he stamps on your hand a unique number. That way when you go to the bar, you show the bartender your, uh, your stamp. She looks at the number, references it, and she charges you a drink. Um, well, that's great, but what if I either see your hand or if I can guess what number you have? So um, essentially these are the two types of, hello? These are the two types of exploitation scenarios. Is this too loud? Too echoey? Okay. These are the two types of exploitation scenarios. So session replay is essentially seeing what someone is doing and mimicking them with their credentials so that it, some action they took occurs again. So for instance, if I see Michael in the bar ordering a drink um, and you know, say he orders a Bloody Mary, uh, then what I can do is the typical example, I would walk over, mimic exactly everything he did you know, with his credentials, and then order him 10 more drinks, and then he gets charged. Um, additionally, session hijacking would be if I dressed up like him, put the number on my hand again, um, either tied him up in the back or just, you know, I didn't even, don't even need to. Oh, wow, that's, that sounds really bad. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, please don't file a harassment suit. Um, and then I would actually order drinks for myself, charging him. So that gives you a decent example on what those two types of attacks are. So in theory, uh, the username and password of a user gets exchanged for this session ID, which is usually a long, hard to guess string. So in theory, you would think that the security levels and standards behind that long string should be the same as your username and password. Many companies make you go through you know, many hoops of uh, password uh, selection because you know, it doesn't satisfy this aspect or you know, too many lowercase characters or um, you know, it's based on a common dictionary word. Unfortunately, a lot of users and developers and vendors don't realize that that session ID uh, is just as important to the authentication and state mechanism of the web application. So it should, in theory, be just as strong, but unfortunately, it isn't. So um, again, just to further uh, um, emphasize that um, that session ID string should be just as secure as a username and password. Thanks for uh, bearing with us, guys. I appreciate it. This is a fantastic turnout for uh, first presentation of the day. I'm sure you guys all stayed in last night, took it easy. <laughs> nice, nice to see you take this stuff seriously. That's great. Um, we'll just give uh, a quick overview on uh, how session IDs are passed and the way that they're stored and set up. When we think of session IDs, we often think of cookies. That's not necessarily the only way that they can be passed. 
A session ID is just a variable, a variable that gets passed between the browser and the server, as David mentioned, as a means of maintaining state. So it can be stored anywhere that uh, variables can be passed back and forth. That would, besides cookies, also include things such as uh, directly embedded within the URL uh, using the get method, or it could be a hidden field within an HTML form. And we'll show some of that and discuss why or why not that's a good idea. Uh, as far as how that session ID, that unique alphanumeric string is generated, that's generally transparent to the individual that's actually coding the web application. They don't need to specifically come up with an algorithm to generate it. That's generally done uh, on their behalf by either the web server or the web application server. Those of you who may be familiar with uh, ASP pages, for example, you know there's a session object and creating a session variable is as simple as calling that object, giving the variable a name, and everything is done in the background. You, the IIS server does that for you. So that's, I mean, it's good and bad. It's, it, it makes it a lot easier for the developer, but at the same time, uh, you're somewhat at the mercy of that server that you're using. If they're not using a, a good algorithm to generate that session ID, you, you may or may not be stuck with that. Yeah, sure. Uh, just basically two types of cookies, persistent cookies and session or non-persistent cookies, basically refers to how long that cookie is stored. The non-persistent simply stays in main memory. Uh, persistent is stored on your hard drive. The persistent cookies are those that you would generally use when you have that remember me option on a website. Um, and again, there's security implications to that because as we'll see, a session ID is effectively a form of authentication. Um, so that needs to be protected. We'll get into specifics about that. This is just a diagram of what a basic cookie looks like, just so you understand the structure of it. it I've got those fields numbered one through seven, so I'll refer to them that way. First field, that's the name of the web server that actually issued that cookie and has the ability to receive that cookie. Number two is a Boolean variable, true, false, uh, just determines if other servers on that same domain uh, can also receive that cookie. Number three, the path to specific pages on the web server that can receive the cookie. So it gives you a greater level of granularity as far as where the, that cookie information will be sent to. Four, another Boolean variable, that determines if uh, you need a secure connection, an SSL connection, before the cookie will be passed. And we'll refer back to that a few times because that's an important one. Number five, that's the expiry. I mentioned persistent versus uh, session or non-persistent cookies. That, that date there, that expiry date, is in Unix time. So it's the number of seconds since January 1970, January 1st, 1970. And if you don't give it uh, an expiry date, by default, it's going to be a, a non-persistent cookie and be deleted when you close the web browser. Six and seven, that's the actual payload of that cookie or the data in a name value format. So in this case, the name of the session ID is Apache. That's how you would refer to it. And seven is the session ID itself. These are just some examples of various sites. Um, you'll see that they all follow that format. Uh, Star Wars, they have the Wookiee cookie, and the other ones are uh, a little less creative than that. I mentioned there's various places that you can store that um, session ID. We discussed cookies. Another one is directly within the URL itself. You'll see at the end of each of these URLs, that string is, is basically a session ID. And obviously, that's not a very secure way of sending it, um, because if somebody gets a hold of that URL, it, they effectively, your authentication is embedded into the URL. Somebody's not going to need to log in with a username and password, so um, not a secure way of doing it. But there are situations where you may want to do that. You see greeting card sites often use this, basically so that a user can go to a unique greeting card. And we'll walk through those examples as well. Just talk about that later. I'm not sure you. Um, then the third thing that I mentioned, as far as how session IDs can be passed, would be within hidden uh, fields within an HTML form. Uh, again, not a very secure way of doing it, but there may be situations where you want to do that. I, I think people often mistakenly believe that it's more secure than it is because an end user 
can't visibly see it in the way they can see a session ID embedded within a URL, but as you know, there's, there's nothing to seeing this. You just have to view the source code of the web page. I just want to put uh, this entire talk sort of in perspective in that uh, we're talking about one very specific technical vulnerability on, on web application security, but with anything in security, you need to look at the, the big picture. I mean, you could have a fantastic algorithm, gives you a very unique, pseudo-random, difficult, if not impossible, to guess session ID, but if other aspects of security that interact with that are very poor, it doesn't do you any good. I mean, let's say your policy called for that cookie to be a persistent one, so it's stored on the hard drive. Who cares if it's a hard to guess algorithm if somebody can grab that cookie and there's poor physical and logical security around the server, it doesn't mean anything. So just keep in perspective that this is only one aspect of web application security. Um, we'll walk through a, an example. We won't be able to go to the web page, but on this one, I, I mentioned uh, that uh, greeting card sites are a good example of, of a site that embeds a session ID directly within the uh, URL. And you've all walked through this, you know how, how, how it operates. You want to send a greeting card to somebody, you log into their site, you make the greeting card, and they receive an email, something like this, that says, click on this URL to see your greeting card. And at the end of it, it'll have the session ID right in there. Now when you, when you first look at it, the session ID is that last 16 characters there. It actually, I mean, it looks random if you only look at one. Uh, you know, it's just a long, hard to guess string. So if you wanted to brute force that, uh, you're going to have to go through 10 to the power of 16 combinations, which will take a very long time to do. But the only way to see if something is truly random is to look at more than one and see if there's uh, anything in common between those URLs, those session IDs. So in this case, what we did is just kept regenerating that greeting card over and over again, just technically, literally, by hitting the back button and, and doing it over. And when, and when we started to look at those variables, we noticed that they weren't all that random. The first three characters, that 83, seems to be some kind of a constant, never changes. And then the next, uh, I don't know, seven or eight characters, that actually turns out to be the date. And that's an important thing, that you want to be careful when you're generating a session ID that it's not using something that is known to the user. And obviously, if the user is creating that greeting card, they know what time they created it, so it's easy for them to figure out. In this case, we, we did this on July 25th at 1221, and you can see that in the 725, 1221. And so what we end up with is actually only four or five um, digits that are actually truly the random or so supposedly random portion of that um, session ID. And, and in this case, they're actually sequential, so they're not even that random at all. So we're, we've gone from having to brute force something that was 10 to the power of 16 down to something that's about 10,000, 100,000 digits, which is much more reasonable. Um, we'll. Uh, We'll save the demo on this for a second, because we'll either, if we have internet access, we'll try it that way. If not, we'll switch over to the other computer. But basically, um, you know, if you want to brute force that, you got 10,000 combinations. One way is obviously get a web browser, start typing it in manually. And if you got nothing better to do, that might be a good way to do it. But easier way is to, to automate that. You might want to write a Perl script or something. In this case, we actually uh, wrote a tool that will allow you to brute force session IDs in various scenarios, in cookies, within URLs. Um, th that's the tool right there. We'll, we'll demo it on the other box. So, But uh, actually, David, do you, do you want to just talk about the sections there? So essentially, um, when we were looking at a lot of web applications uh, in, a, in our audits uh, in past lives, um, really the only uh, decent way to tell if a session ID is predictable is by looking at it. It'd be nice if there were some neat AI program or neural net, you could just run it through and it would have a yes or no button and yes, predictable, no, non predictable. Uh, but unfortunately, the easiest way to figure it out is just by looking at a bunch of session IDs generated in sequence, uh, very close to one another. So essentially, this is a tool that has three aspects to it, three mini tools. I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, this should be on the uh, DEF CON CD. It's an open source tool. You can look at the uh, 
uh, spaghetti visual basic code that uh, I put together. Um, essentially, the top part uh, allows you to sample those uh, session IDs uh, that are generated just from the website. This is version one. Uh, version two would be nice if you could actually generate the session IDs after you log into that website. So you'd have to actually include the uh, post information in that as well with the credentials. Uh, so essentially, you can just, uh, if we have time later, um, if we get network connection, I'll show you. Um, using redhat.com as the example, they actually use the IP address, uh, your IP address, to append to um, you know some bit of entropy, some random numbers. Uh, they don't use that necessarily for authentication, but it's just a decent example. This middle part of the tool is uh, uh, basic authentication brute forcing, which really isn't within the scope of our presentation, but um, we had all the same hooks in there to do a lot of this anyway, so we might as well, it was kind of an added bonus. Uh, the, the last part is where the real meat of this brute forcing is, and I'm just going to put these two windows sort of side by side, almost as if we're running it in real time. Uh, if you look, if you switch your eyes really quickly, you may actually see some movement, but I'm not sure if that's from what you were doing last night. Um, essentially, what you can see is we pasted a really long URL um, into the URL field. Um, so the scenario is essentially if I know that Michael sent his girlfriend a, you know, a really scintillating greeting card, and I can figure out you know when the time was, at least I have a range to work with. Oh, is that, is that what I mean? Like, no. Oh, sure. What, what we can do is we'll just we'll show you another example. Um, we have a standalone box with a web server. At least you can see some of the cookie generation. Um, but then you, you paste that URL in and, and use a, a combination of regular expressions to tell the uh, tool which characters you want to grind through. Um, so I'll just give you a brief demo on this computer. This will just run it locally off of my machine. This, I apologize, I'm totally not a redneck. This was an application <laughs> from a school project. And this morning as we were in the hotel room, we are like, we need something that makes session IDs. I was like, cool, I got it. It's left over from school. But it, uh, it just ignore it, all right? Pretend it's like a Linux site or something. <laughs> Michael, is a fantasy NASCAR. Is that an oxymoron? Yeah, sorry, wrong tool. <laughs> so we have um, IIS running on this server. It's standalone, so stop getting your laptops out. Uh, what we're doing is we're just, uh, you want to just walk through the demo? Yeah, sure. Just, so all we were doing is we know that the website uses session IDs. Um, and so we want to see that randomness. So we want to generate a succession of them. So with that first part, we're able to just put the URL directly into there say we want how many cookies, in this case 10, and just get the cookies and then it's spit out in the bottom. And in this case they are fairly random. I asked as a reasonable job. And, but that's the first step of allowing you to look at it and then decide is there some non-randomness that I can brute force. And actually, why don't you walk through the, uh, the regular expression, please? Sure. Switch mic. Yeah. So the, um, we'll see the URL and cookie field. Um, you can actually brute force either. If you wanted to just, just brute force the URL, we put the regular expressions in there. If you want the URL constant, uh, you paste the cookie in. And essentially, it takes care of all the formatting for you. Uh, you just have to have a basic uh, variable equals value format here. So we have. ASP session ID, blah, 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 equals, and then this really long string. So let's try and just brute force the last digit. Um, you put the starting digit, or the starting character in there, which is going to be A. I don't know if you, can any of you see this on the screen? Okay, so I'll just walk you through it. You put the character there, and essentially, if you just click on the tab, you can test it out when you uh, try it out on the CD. Just click the info tab. It's, it's kind of obscure, but once you actually look at it, you'll understand what the ranges mean. Uh, you can do 0 through 9, little a through little z, big A through big Z, and then the combination of those together. Um, so essentially, what you see here is us grinding through each one. Uh, you'll see two radio buttons at the bottom. Um, the first one is just, I'm going to click on it here. Just look for a non-404 header, which means you're grinding through a URL in addition you know, with a possible cookie in there. 
uh, and you're getting a page back. Now, assuming that the web server hasn't customized their error message, you may um, get you know, a, a 200 success. This is the web page. Congratulations, you've authenticated. Uh, some websites have custom error messages like, you know, these aren't the web pages you're looking for. Um, go away, nosy, etc. So what you can do is actually click on this radio button and tell it what a successful web web brute force would look like, what string in it would it would have, such as welcome to your account or you know, et cetera. So that that's the tool in a nutshell. Why don't you do mini browser as well? Yeah. And this is just another tool, mini browser, uh, that we like to use. Um, essentially it's just a browser with different fields that you can kind of watch the transaction, the web transaction take place. So uh, this is uh, Michael's NASCAR login. If you look at the log, you'll see the, the cookie actually getting passed back and forth. Uh, if you actually click on cookies, you can see them all um, uh, listed out pretty nicely. We're going to show you another example of this later. So, I'm sorry? version the Visual Basic. Uh, it's open source, so you can actually see the code for yourself and improve it. Uh, and send it back to me, and I'll take credit for it. Uh, I'm, I'm just joking. If you want to actually help out with it, I'd be glad to um, post a new version with any uh, improvements. And, and there are some improvements I have in mind. So um, let's actually switch sides again. Okay, why is this bad? Obviously it's bad because you can actually get into a user's account without their username and password. Um, it's really easy to exploit, as you saw. Now you all have the tool. It's even easier to exploit. Um, unlike uh, typical login scenarios like uh, on an operating system or a lot of other web, app web applications, if you have five failed logins sometimes and that account is locked out, well, brute forcing session IDs, it's really hard to uh, detect a failed. There's no necessarily um, a failed login scenario in brute forcing a, a session ID or getting a, wrong, a, a bad session ID. Uh, additionally, there aren't a lot of intrusion detection systems that detect these types of attacks. Um, I, would, I would say none, but I, I have a, a feeling that some are actually coming out that would start to detect these, um, these types of um, exploits. Uh, additionally, really the only way you'll know that someone is trying to do this is by looking at your log data, which I, I don't think a lot of us do. Uh, essentially, you would either see a lot of error messages, um, or you'd see a lot of error messages that are followed by the successful um, login on your access, your successful access log. Um, I'm just going to mention that uh, this last point. Um, there's a myth that I'm sure a lot of you run up against that SSL secures all. And obviously it doesn't. What I wanted to say is SSL server side doesn't really do much to protect you against these types of attacks. When I say server side, which really describes most of the SSL uh, certificate scenarios out there, the web server has a certificate, the client doesn't. Um, in a, another PKI sense, if you wanted to actually issue certificates to your clients, authenticate them in that way as well, uh, that might actually protect against a lot of these attacks because it would redirect you to a uh, authentic authentication screen. Uh, unfortunately, this really isn't feasible uh, in a business sense. Uh, if you're in a very small environment, you could do this or an intranet. Uh, I just wanted to point out um, kind of a news hit that occurred for this type of attack. Um, essentially, it's, it's interesting that you know a few years ago, web application security was a dot on the radar. Now you see you know, exploit scripting hole exposes Hotmail, and you see this on CNN.com. So it, it's good in a way because users and the internet community are becoming aware that um, these types of attacks are bad. Unfortunately, this was uh, based on a bug track posting by I think Mark Slimko, and he said, "Hey." Um, I'm a Verizon wireless customer, and when I logged in, I got this URL. And I'm not sure if you can see it on the screen. Uh, there's a portion in red, and that's uh, an ID. He got redirected to this URL. In fact, all Verizon wireless customers were redirected to a URL similar to this. The only difference was that number was different. Well, it seems that by incrementing or decrementing that number, you can see other users' uh, information, uh, billing information, uh, credit card information. Oops. So uh, this is it's good in a way because um, I'm sure Verizon fixed it very quickly once this news item came out. It's bad because who knows how many other customers were affected. I'm not sure if you can see the screen. Securitypimps.com. Um, it's an actual site. 
Uh, it's actually my site, not really doing much with it except just playing around with Flash and maybe forming a hacker group someday. I'm not sure we'd have to be based outside of Nevada just because of the name or outside of Las Vegas in Nevada. Um, that joke really bombed. So um, essentially, I host this at register.com. Uh, register.com lets you, as a, as a registrant, uh, they provide you a, a web access uh, portal, web application that you can manage your domain in. It's the domain manager, so you log in, uh, change any DNS settings. Um, I was trying to change the setting one day when I forgot my password. So essentially what you do in the forgot forgotten password scheme is you put in the domain name and it, an email gets sent to the administrative contact of that domain. Uh, no matter who you are, you can, you can cause this to occur. You can cause the forgotten password to occur. So the email got sent to pimpdaddy at securitypimps.com. That's me. I'm not going to make a joke about it since the first one bombed. And, um, and we're running a long time. Uh, so essentially, you get this long URL. Um, and if in a three-day time period someone visits that URL, you're not even asked for your old password. You can change the password. So think of it this way. If I know your domain, uh, or if I know a domain is hosted on register.com, I can plug in the domain name. Um, and figure out that, well, let me go back. By pressing back and submit a few times, I got these URLs in my email as well. Um, so obviously, those session IDs after, if, can you see the uh, numbers? Uh, sure, if, if you can't, essentially, we whittled down what was a 12-digit session ID to what was now five. So. Um, if you had a, a domain on register.com and you knew someone else that you could submit them at the same time, essentially figure out what that was in proximity and probably shave that time off so that I, I think I figured it out. If, if, if you wanted to submit it when someone goes home from work around 6 and try and brute force it when someone actually shows up again around 8 or 9, um, you could probably do that 50% uh, of the time uh, if you were doing maybe one request a second. So. We, we won't go through these uh, examples. One, one is D-Film um, and one is Sendomatic. I'll just explain really quick what they were. That's a situation where a session ID was passed directly within the URL and there was no randomness. They were just purely incrementing that number. You know, D-Film is where you make your own little personal flash movie and send it to somebody. And they, they weren't at all using that session ID for security. They were just using it to allow you to see a, a unique video or whatever. Um, and I just the important thing to note there is that they may not have been planning security in there because you can just increment that session ID, you'll see somebody else's uh, video or Sendomatic is one of those sites where you set up a party and you send invites to people. If you increment it, you can see other people's parties and invite your friends to their party and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> And even though they may not have used it, they may have not planned security in there, their users may not have that same perception. They may think that they are the only people who can see their, um, their greetings and their invitations. So never design something to your security spe specifications. You have to design it to your end user specifications. If they think there's security in there, find out there's not, that's not a good way to keep your clients around. Um, we have about 10 minutes. Um, we're probably going to run five minutes late, just to let you know. I'm a big believer in doing things on time, especially having brief uh, presentations and, and, and agreeing to end when you're going to end. But we started a little late, so just, just to let you know. Um, uh, freeservers.com is where I host security pimps. Uh, again, same sort of scenario. You have a web application, you log in, and in this case, I actually can change the content. Free servers is a, a free web hosting service. Uh, essentially, you can pick from a bunch of domains. Um, this one I just picked testing, 123.itgo.com. Uh, um, so essentially, you log in, uh, username and password, you go into your uh, login screen, you can change content, you can you know, upload content, delete content. Um, so using mini browser, just as an example, uh, we can't do this online, but uh, we log in, you can see that our cookie uh, is actually, go to the next screen where you can actually see it. All right, so it looks like a fairly random cookie, but every time I logged in, I uh, actually got the same cookie. So hmm. uh, a lot of developers make the mistake of obfusc obfuscating, obfuscating, say that in the morning, um, the, the session ID with just a very basic encoding mechanism like Base64 or HEX, and they think, ah, ha, ha, no one will ever figure that out. Well, um, just for kicks, I put it through a Base64 decoder, um, 
and security stats actually has a decent one. And if we were to go to this link uh, and paste it, you would see that that string decoded, uh, base64 decoded, is the, my domain name, colon, and then my password. Just to let you know, everyone who's firing up your browser, change the password already, so don't, don't try and log in. Um, so essentially, um, this is a case where I don't necessarily need to brute force it in the traditional sense, character by character, but I can use a dictionary attack. So what I did, um, wrote a Perl script, which is included in uh, a paper on your CD. Uh, all these Perl scripts are included. Uh, wrote a paper, it basically runs through a dictionary attack, takes the uh, password, uh, words, appends it to the domain, runs base64 on it, and tries to load a browser, uh, and essentially sees if we get a successful uh, login. So, um, yeah, just go ahead. Um, or if you really, you know, have nothing to do on the weekend, um, you know, you can definitely brute force every single character, but, you know, why bother? Uh, and just to mention, um, some sites actually use the URL and the cookie uh, to store the session ID. We, we showed Amazon earlier as one that actually stores the URL and before you raise your hand after uh, and say, well, they use the cookie as well, it's true. But they actually use a lot of the same uh, information in the URL that's just stored in the cookie. Um, so you know, while you think you're really clever by using a cookie to store this information and you're doing all the things you should be doing by storing it over SSL or sending it over SSL, if it's also in the URL, then someone may still be able to get that information. Uh, additionally, if you're storing information in the URL, a lot of proxy servers store that information in logs. So if someone were to break into your proxy server uh, and see a session ID from you know, a past login, uh, that authentication information is right, right in there and viewable. Um, essentially, just to break the six common problems behind session IDs, uh, the first four actually relate to brute forcing. So weak algorithm, obviously, um, if I generate an algorithm, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, blah, 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 12, not a very good algorithm, it's predictable. Uh, re reverse engineerable as well, you just saw. Uh, username and password uh, and, and through some encoding mechanism. The second uh, problem, no form of account lockout. And there's really no real way to combat this. Uh, if you saw an IP address coming in, trying to brute force a session ID, you, know, you can't exactly lock out an IP address on the internet realistically, uh, especially because of the way ISPs tend to randomize um, IP addresses like AOL. I believe AOL still does this. Uh, after each click of a web browser, your IP address actually changes. Um, so that's just another problem to exhaust, that exacerbates this. Short key space, um, I thought of a decent example. This is my luggage lock. And essentially, assume that there's a random code each time, every time I lock it. Um, it's, you know, it's great. You, you, need, you need code every time so no one can guess it. Uh, unfortunately, it's easy to brute force. I have four dials on here, zero to nine. Now, obviously, someone could brute force that probably within a day. Again, if they were doing all these other things on that weekend, they had nothing to do. Um, what we could do, though, is if we wanted to increase the key space, we could either create a bunch of dials that go all the way out you know, for two feet, but also had zero to nine on it, or we could increase the length of the dials, including some other characters on it. Um, so I'll just give you an, an idea of what I mean by key space. Uh, again, indefinite expiration on the server. If you click the Remember Me button, it gives an attacker uh, however long they want to brute force a session ID. Pretty straightforward. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the last two. Uh, essentially, you all understand that if you capture a session ID in transit, um, or if you're able to get a user to load some malicious Trojan horse that then sends it to you, you can then log into his application. These are just some tools, all free tools, that you can use as a website, web application developer to help you, or as an auditor of somebody else's stuff to determine if it's secure or whatever else you guys choose to use it for. The, uh, the first one, Session Auditor, that was the tool that we showed you, the one that we wrote, and uh, allows you to brute force those session IDs. Web Sleuth um, is a great tool. It does a lot of different things. Sessions Auditor is actually embedded within that tool, so you get the same functionality, but Web Sleuth will allow you to do a lot more. And then the last four, Web Proxy, HTTP Push, Achilles, and Mini Browser. We showed you Mini Browser. Those are all effectively personal proxies. So what they're allowing you to do is not to brute force that session ID, but to intercept the communications between the browser and the server so that you can see what's happening in the background. You can see how that session ID is getting passed. And with most of those, it'll also allow you to adjust things before that session ID is sent. So you're sort of doing a manual brute force. Um, 
what can you do as a user? Obviously, as a user, you're at the mercy of the um, application, the web application that you're using. But there are still some uh, common sense protective measures that you can take. One, logging out when your session is done so that if they're using that session uh, cookie to use the session ID, it'll get wiped off the server. And so if somebody steals it, it's not going to work for them anymore. Don't select your member me option. Remember me option is good in some situations if it's security is not involved, but all that's doing is maintaining that session ID on your hard drive, and if somebody has access to your hard drive, they can grab it. And everybody knows where to find it. You know, Netscape stores the cookies in a certain place, i.e. stores it in a certain place. It's always in the same place, so. Then um, that ties into the third one. Use SSL when you can. David mentioned, you know, it's not perfect because if you can get something at one of the endpoints or at a proxy in the middle, you can still intercept it. But it does prevent somebody from sniffing that session ID, which is obviously a good thing. And patching your browser with anything, you've got to keep the patches up to date. Um, the big thing right now is cross-site scripting attacks. We see new ones every day. And, and keeping your browser patches up to date will help you from not uh, somebody help you from not allowing somebody to grab your session ID through a cross-site scripting attack. And, you know, a session ID is an authentication mechanism, so treat it the way you would treat a username and password. If, if you're passing it around in an email, just keep that in mind, that it, that's what it's doing. Just to follow on to cross-site scripting, um, obviously cross-site scripting is a server-side problem, but there are a few um, browser-specific issues that um, some cross-site scripting works on older versions of Netscape um, that don't work on the newer versions, etc. Obviously, though, a lot of cross-site scripting stuff is dependent on the vendor to either fix or um, make sure it doesn't affect authentication. Um, so what can you do as a software vendor? If you're actually here in the audience and you've grown your facial hair out in the last week with wanting to mingle in, um, this is, um, these are the things that software vendors can do to make sure um, that their applications are more resilient to application brute forcing. Obviously, you're not going to be immune to it by the very nature of most of these state mechanisms. Uh, regenerate the session ID after a set period of time. Um, this helps if someone actually sees the information in your proxy. Um, it just makes it harder for an attacker. Uh, my favorite is create booby-trapped session IDs in the application. So if you have, um, essentially, uh, I have five minutes, okay. This, uh, my five minute over plan wasn't gonna, isn't going to go uh, over well. Um, but essentially, just create a booby trapped ID so that one that never gets generated, but one that you can detect if someone's going through a range. Um, when practical, limit the successful sessions to specific IP addresses. Again, this will only work in an internet environment. This really isn't uh, realistic for an inter internet uh, application. It, in an environment where you have control over the physical aspects of where people are logging in, for instance, if you only want someone to log in from you know, this, this desk and the, and the SOC, um, and then really, that's, that's the only way this uh, option will, will play. Um, auto expire the sessions if someone walks away. Um, and the last one is something cool. Um, it's kind of hard to explain, but essentially when we talked about a replay attack, if you're uh, going to check out of a sh shopping cart, uh, someone actually sees that checkout request and then just fires a bunch more checkout requests. So you get, you know, on Amazon, you get 10 copies of um, Kama Sutra for dummies instead of the one you ordered. Um, essentially, what you can do is the page before that, uh, put a nonce or another type of session ID that requires you actually come from that page. And Yahoo does this. They call it a crumbs. Uh, that's their official term for it. Uh, most important, just use a good algorithm uh, and make sure the inputs to that algorithm aren't based on time or uh, user, uh, user ID or password. Uh, some good pseudo number random generators, EGADs, uh, Yarrow, Y-A-R-R-O-W. Uh, what can you do as someone who actually has to, has to buy this type of software? Well, um, a lot of this software actually does have the ability to generate uh, hard to guess, hard to brute force session IDs. You just have to configure it. Some of them have a few levels, but uh, unfortunately, out, out of the box, they are uh, very, very low level. And again, test, test your system. Um, I mean, you should be able to know as a vendor if, or as a, a developer if your system is uh, prone to these attacks. It's your responsibility, in a sense, to your users. Um, I want to leave just a, a one or two minutes for questions, but essentially we talked about OWASP. Um, we already talked about OWASP. In conclusion, users, just be aware. Developers, configure your sites properly and your systems properly uh, and test them. And software vendors, fix your software. Uh, just some resources. 
yeah, if, if you have questions, uh, you want to just come up uh, after. Um, unless you, you really have one that's burning a hole and you want everyone to hear. Just, yeah, just one question, sorry. I'm sorry, did you say that once more? Uh, question is, can you use the SSL session ID for session tracking? There's actually a decent thread about this, I believe, on the web application security list. The answer is no, you really can't uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, it was just never meant to integrate well into web applications. And often you have proxy servers that may strip that out uh, before they actually get to the web application. But if anyone wants more detail on that question or they just want to come up after, please do. Thanks for attending. Sorry we started late.